We're here this morning for this timely national consultation on the development prospects for Dominica within the context of the Citizenship by Investment Program as a platform for raising the funds necessary to finance development activities. I want to start, therefore, with an apt quote from the Honorable Prime Minister when on March 29th he announced this consultation and scheduled it for the 24th of April 2017. And I quote, I want the best for all Dominicans. The workers are entitled to the best possible package, but so are the patients of the PMH. So are the children of our schools. So are the retirees, the indigent, and less fortunate. We have a duty as Dominicans to be fair and reasonable and to ensure that no sector is advantaged over the other. So I look forward to a focused conversation with the social partners at which we shall discuss the current performance and short and long, short and medium term prognosis for the Dominican economy, end of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the 24th of April and we're here. It is only fitting that we hear first from the Honorable Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica to share with us in his welcome remarks some thoughts on today's consultation. Honorable Pierre. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, first let me thank each and every one of you for demonstrating your interest in national development by sacrificing your Monday morning to respond positively to our invitation. I know that for the private sector in particular, Monday represents the start of the work week, and it is that one time when nine out of 10 invitations taking you out of the office would be turned down. I am pleased, therefore, that you have recognized the importance of this national consultation and chosen to be part of our discussions here this morning. I sincerely hope that by the end of today's session, you would have gained a better understanding of the dynamics of the Dominican economy and the path forward that must be pursued for the social and economic well-being of all Dominicans. Ladies and gentlemen, for many here in attendance and the thousands following this broadcast at home as well as those tuned in from the offices in Dominica and overseas, it would appear somewhat cliche way to be said that with the attainment of political independence comes national responsibility coupled with an expectation of societal maturity. You have no doubt heard this submission countless times before. The reality nonetheless is that every Dominican must step up and respond to the challenge of appreciating that he or she has a crucial role to play in shaping and building the type of country and society that we will live in, and more importantly, that which we shall pass to future generations. This national conversation is but another step towards the synthesization to and the realization of that goal. Ever so often, we need as a people to stop and take stock. In cricketing parlance, it is known as taking fresh guard. I am persuaded that for us to succeed in getting all citizens to buy into the formula that is required for the new pathways to progress that are to be pursued, we must each have access to vital credible information. Hence, we have convened this morning and assembled a high caliber of resource persons to provide insights into the realities of the economic environment in which we shall operate in the short to medium term. The theme of the discussion today is development, development prospects for Dominica within the context of the Citizenship by Investment Program as a platform for raising the funds necessary 
to finance development activities. This must be viewed in the wider context of the current economic realities of the world. I wish to quote from an October 2016 publication of the Economic Commission on Latin America and the Caribbean on the world economy, which states, and I quote, the prolonged period to slow growth worldwide poses a challenge for achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and financing remains severely constrained. Since the international financial crisis of 2008, the world economy experienced low rates of growth and recurrent bouts of instability and uncertainty. The persistent weakness of aggregate demand in the advanced economies continues to de depress global growth. At the same time, low commodity prices and growing fiscal and current account balances, as well as the tightening of fiscal and monetary policies, have deemed the outlook for developing countries that export natural resources. Focus suggests that the world economy will remain on this recessionary trend which is dampening growth prospects and inhibiting the recovery of international trade, investment, productivity, and wages." End of quote. The pace at which we're able to develop and grow has a direct correlation to the financial resources available to us and the human resource capacity of our society. Very often, we tend to become entrapped by the terminology of national independence and sovereignty, and overlook the crucial consideration of capacity. In the final analysis, Dominica is but a nation of 72,000 souls residing on landmass of 290 square miles. Whatever we seek and aspire to achieve must be within the capacity and capability of that 72,000 population to sponsor and sustain. We are fortunate not only as a government, but most significantly as a nation, to have been blessed in recent years with the manifestation of genuine friendship and well wishes from cherished sister countries and institutions, which have been very kind and generous to this country and its inhabitants. But the world is changing, and more and more it is becoming evident that going forward we must have the fortitude and discipline to chart a path predicated on our capacity and ability to finance and pay our way through life. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that inflows of foreign direct investment into the, into the Caribbean are declining. We need, therefore, as a nation, to sit and analyze what is possible and what is practical within the constraints of our small population base and very limited resources. We need to know what we can commit to over a 12-month, three-year, five-year, or 10-year period based on guaranteed supply. Earlier, I made reference to the practice of business leaders to sit on Monday mornings and plan their company's work schedule for the week. These schedules are predicated on anticipated performance criteria. What is produced is inextricably linked to what is earned, and what is earned influences and determines, in large measure, what expenditures can be made and committed. Simply put, a basic rule of thumb in the world of business is that you should not spend more than you're likely, or even more prudently, what you're guaranteed to earn. To do otherwise is to court serious danger. The same practice, ladies and gentlemen, applies to the management of the national economy. However, for the state, it becomes even more complicated when the variable of social responsibility, which does not apply to the private sector, is factored into the equation. For whether earnings are up, up to par or not, there are social obligations that a country has to its citizens and from which it cannot escape, irrespective of budgetary constraints or realities. Two years ago, 
when Dominica was adversely impacted by Tropical Storm Erica. National productivity and earnings fell to a frighteningly low levels, but still operations at the Princess Margaret Hospital had to be maintained. Our children had to be transported to school and tutored for the entire school day. Our seniors still had to be paid their pensions and other entitlements under the law. Public officers still had to be paid. The streets and communities still had to be cleaned. Adequate street lighting still had to be provided. And police officers still had to be deployed across the nation to provide a sense of assurance and security for citizens and visitors alike. None of these undertakings was revenue generating, but they had to be provided because of the social responsibility that government and by extension the country has to its people. All of these necessities that I have mentioned fall within the ambit of what must be done and assured regardless of circumstance or earnings. The professionals at the head table would describe this as recurrent expenditures. Those things that are mandatory irrespective of ebbs and flows of an economy. Capital expenditures are those projects we enter into from time to time, for which a clear source of funding has been identified and can be relied upon. As a small de developing nation, there is no shortage of project ideas which we can all create and put on the table. But the question of where the monies shall come from will sooner or later taper expectations to reality. Work is currently underway at a new national hospital because as Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, I know how that project will be financed, how and from where the equipment will be sourced, and the type of technical and professional assistance I can rely upon when the construction has ended and the facility in use. I would not have agreed to the groundbreaking if I did not have the confidence of seeing that project through to completion. The same applies to the soon be, to be opened new Westbridge. 13 months ago, we embarked upon that project because we were certain of and confident in our minds as to where the funding for that project would come from. That is the type of wise and prudent fiscal management that is going to be required if Dominica is to continue to defy the odds and keep its social and economic ship of state not only afloat, but cruising. Thus, for our current expenditures to be linked in a major way to that which we can 100% guarantee is serviceable and can be honored. Our capital expenditures must be predicated on what we believe we have a very good chance of accomplishing based on projected revenues and commitments. What we must ensure as a people is that projected revenues are not undermined by actions and utterances of our own making. In other words, we should do nothing as a people to undermine our own economic survival. That is why in the area of tourism, for example, we make the point that tourism is everybody's business. Any harmful action or negative utterances could hurt the entire industry and undermine the economic sustainability of our country. The same applies to projected revenues from the Citizenship by Investment program. This is a trusted but yet very vulnerable source of funding for the country. Its continued growth is dependent on the image that it enjoys in the marketplace. Any sustained attack on the program, for whatever reason, will eventually adversely impact its performance and ultimately could bring about its demise. We all need to know and understand this as Dominicans. The completion the competition, sorry, in this sphere of economic activity is too great for a small nation like Dominica to emerge unscathed from constant and prolonged criticism of and controversy surrounding its program. In the final analysis, 
what a prospective candidate for citizenship will hear from those who unjustifiably criticize the program is that this program is questionable, that it should be avoided in preference for another. That is all he or she will pay heed to, whether we wish to believe it or not. Each of us assembled here today is a consumer. If questions are raised about the suitability of a product that we consume, that creates doubts in our minds about its continued utility. We know that after a while, we will go tired of the controversy, skepticism, and doubt, and look elsewhere for an identical or comparable product. The same applies to programs such as the CBI. They cannot withstand the type of constant battering to which Dominica is being subjected over and over. Eventually, something will give. And I fear one day it could be our program if the constant badgering does not stop. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, this event here this morning is about us meeting as national stakeholders and availing ourselves of the opportunity to draw on the knowledge and expertise of those among us who can be relied upon to bring and provide objective input and analysis on the health and workings of the Dominican economy. I know that there are scores of special interest groups that would wish for their particular and peculiar needs to be addressed and met as a matter of urgency. The, or the role of each sectoral leader is to secure the very best for those whose interests he or she represents. But it is the duty of the government to approach and set this against the wider and overarching need and desire to guarantee all 72,000 inhabitants of this fair land a reasonable and deserving existence. So as I said a few weeks ago, we have as a nation to consider the plight of all interest groups. Students studying abroad are deserving of timely payment of lodging and tuition fees. But so too are seniors who, in my opinion, have earned the right to a dignified standard of living, whether or not in their formative years they were in a position to contribute towards the upkeep in retirement. By the same token, today's public officers are deserving of a fair and affordable reward for the very good job they do in helping to implement and oversee the administration of government's policies. All in this country who knock on the doors of government have very strong and compelling reasons for attention and affirmative action. But a wider consideration must be that of all of our other compatriots who too pay taxes, who have paid their dues, or who by virtue of their tender ages are deserving of our solid investment in their futures. To this end, the art of good governance in the year 2017 will demand that we seek out ways and means of managing our slender resources to the equitable benefit of all 72,000 resident Dominicans and the thousands of visitors who contribute annually to our economic upkeep. So ladies and gentlemen, my assigned role this morning is to welcome you to this event. I am here, believe it or not, like you, a participant. I have brought my pen and paper, and I'm here to learn from your perspectives and experiences of the realities that confront us, and to work with you to formulate a best case strategy going forward. Before I conclude my initial remarks, I wish to commend the resource persons who have given generously of their time and are willing today to share their experiences and expertise. They are Dominicans who are competent and very committed to the task of helping to guide Dominica throughout this period and process of global economic repositioning. We should be proud as a nation to have a cadre of professionals of this caliber, and I would like for us to treat them today as we would external practitioners whom, though experienced and academically qualified, may not have a full appreciation of the nuances of our Dominica day-to-day Dominica -day reality. Once again, I welcome one and all to this national conversation. We need to talk to 
and with one another and stop shouting across the airwaves and social media at each other. Dominica, in the final analysis, is the responsibility of its 72,000 inhabitants and the thousands who reside abroad, but whose hearts and souls are permanently etched in the destiny of this country. Thanks one and all for coming, and I look forward to an enlightening and productive next few hours. Thank you and God bless you. So from 2014, the ministries and portfolios were configured to proceed on this journey to fulfill the dream on behalf of all Dominicans. We in the public service have made it our primary task, as we all should, to implement the policies of government developed from this broad vision in all areas, including health, education, social welfare, agriculture, tourism, housing, and infrastructure, to name a few. This financial year alone, in excess of $700 million, is invested by government in the development process. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2014, it is also a fact that that same year, the opposition presented to the nation a vision of becoming the best in the form of a social contract to rescue Dominica. They too presented policies and programs that in their view would fulfill the vision were they to become the government. I am sure that they too would have had their strategies to finance these programs. I took the opportunity also to review the mission and vision of the Dominica Employers Federation as they too are focused on the sustained competitiveness, growth and development of the Dominica private sector and the nation. The Dominica Association of Industry and Commerce follows with an approach to embracing opportunity and challenge to achieve the highest level of competitiveness, economic, economic growth, and development. I then checked with the trade unions and found that there too was the same level of commitment. The Public Service Union, for example, the largest on the island, in its strategic plan is committed to ensuring that members and their families enjoy a high quality of life. The churches made the same general commitment. So the Dominica Christian Council, for example, as a member of the World Council of Churches, has as its goal Christian unity, where its members commit, among other objectives, to engage in Christian service by serving human needs, breaking down barriers, between people, seeking justice and peace, and upholding the integrity of creation. I am sure that the Dominica Association of Evangelical Churches subscribe to a similar mission. You may be asking by now where I'm heading with this. Examining the mission, visions, and objectives of political parties, government and opposition, employer organizations, trade unions, and churches, I am certain that you have also drawn some conclusions of your own. Many in our usual culturally influenced kind of dualistic fashion would be asking, if so, what then is the problem? Why don't we get along better? Why are we not closer to our development goals? Some of us in the, in the advent of social media would be quick to point out all of the wrong that is on the island. Blame every single sector, especially the government and the public service, and even list with conviction what decisions they think cabinet should take to fix all the challenges. I wish today to at the commencement of this 
national dialogue to engage you, the social partners, in cultivating a new mindset based on the following realization. We should start by saying, thank God that our hearts are in the right places. We all love Dominica and want the best for our island home. I do believe that this is true for the majority of patriotic and peace-loving Dominicans, whether resident here or in the diaspora. We have much more, ladies and gentlemen, in common than we let on. If then the objectives, visions, mission statements of our key state institutions, non-governmental organizations are true, and I firmly believe that they are, then we as a people must come to the realization that once united in purpose, we can remain on a correct path to our country's development with one caveat that we remain true to our respective missions and vision that all speak of advancing Dominica through those through different approaches. It therefore follows from this awareness that we as a people in our respective agencies, organizations, both government and non-government, need each other and must continue to find common ground as we collaborate as partners and drivers of the development process. No one sector has all the answers. And for those of us who think we have answers and we are qualified, just take a look at the prospectus of any leading university and you will see the amount of disciplines, career paths, and sub-sub-career paths that exist today. Ladies and gentlemen, or should I say partners in development, a sincere conversation on financing Dominica's development is one sure way to kickstart and energize this process. As Ambassador Lambert always reminds me, Dominica, we should know, is a really difficult piece of real estate to manage. Today's dialogue, therefore, is another opportunity to raise awareness of our obvious responsibility to national development with the hope that we will renew our resolve to first love our country and our people and to take joint ownership of our country's development starting first with our responsibility to ourselves, our health and well-being, our responsibility to our families and household, and most importantly, in today's context, responding to the task that we are assigned, and in most cases, paid to perform in the respective positions that we hold in the organizations and institutions that we are part of. We have to then feed this devotion into a new energy, a new consciousness, a new national spirit. It is my hope that this consultation on development prospects is the first of many as we chart our course for the development of a small, vulnerable, but increasingly united island state. In this presentation, I will outline the Citizenship by Investment Program, the process, and to place in context the financing of government programs and other programs of economic development utilizing the CBI resources. It is assumed that economic growth and development of our country is a goal that every citizen desires. It is also generally expected that economic growth and development is the best way to reduce poverty levels and improve the quality of life of our people. That notwithstanding, while growth prospects are pursued, there is a responsibility to assist those in need of special support, social support, social protection. This twin pillar approach 
is clearly spelled out in the government's Growth and Social Protection Strategy, GSPS. The GSPS identifies physical infrastructure as a binding constraint on the attainment of our country's growth objectives. Thus, government continues its relentless pursuit of its two-pronged strategy of sectoral development, including physical infrastructural development, while at the same time ensuring that adequate social protection measures are in place to cater to the needs of the less fortunate segments of the population. We are all fully aware of the additional challenges to our country's physical infrastructure created by Tropical Storm America. In that context, I quote from the public information notice issued by the International Monetary Fund at the conclusion of the last Article 4 mission conducted in March of this year. And I quote, since Tropical Storm America in August 2015, government's efforts continue to focus on infrastructure rehabilitation and social relief while addressing fiscal sustainability. Significant efforts and resources were allocated to the reconstruction of public infrastructure and support to the affected population, while the first generation of fiscal measures committed in the rapid credit facility disbursement and some additional measures have been passed." End quote. Thus, the IMF recognizes the need to pay attention to infrastructure and social relief even as government continues to pursue fiscal sustainability. The traditional way of financing public expenditure in development countries is through the imposition of taxes, grants, and loans. Every country has a tax regime that finances its day-to-day -day operations, including education, security, health, and communication. Increasingly, countries have recognized that they must be innovative and identify other ways for financing development and meeting the needs of their citizens. Citizenship by investment programs have been implemented in many countries all over the world, developed and developing countries, as a means of encouraging investments in both the private and public sectors. It should be noted that countries have various regimes through which an individual can qualify and apply to become a citizen. For example, in Dominica, a person not born in Dominica, but who has lived continuously in Dominica for a given period of time, can apply to the government to become a citizen. By the same token, if that person meets the requirements, a person who applies on the Citizenship by Investment Program is issued the same naturalization certificate as is issued to other naturalized persons. A citizenship by investment program is therefore only one of the means by which an individual can become a citizen. It is a means through which an individual can obtain citizenship and through that process, government can raise much needed revenues. The economic citizenship program was introduced to Dominica by the Freedom Party administration under the late Dame Mary Eugenia Charles. And the rationale then was to increase inflows of foreign direct investment to the country and to facilitate the implementation of development projects which would be financed by a means other than by loans or taxes. This still remains the rationale today. Throughout the years, successive governments put forward changes to the program with a view to making it more relevant to its time. And in recent years, the Economic Citizenship Program, as it was called initially, was renamed and, the citizenship, and replaced with the term Citizenship by Investment Program. And so the CBIP in Dominica is governed by SRO 37 of 2014, as amended in 2016. These regulations provide two paths to citizenship, a direct monetary investment, an investment in a development project. And they are established, the regulations establishes the Citizenship by Investment Unit, whose responsibility it is to administer the program. The regulations also provide for the fees and the investments that are payable, subject to the specific terms and conditions 
an investor can apply and be granted citizenship if the stipulated level of investment is, is made. The recruitment of staff to the CBIU, that is the Citizenship by Investment Unit, is done consistent with the processes of government and appointments are made by the Public Service Commission. Staff is exposed to on-the-job training in best practices in the processing of applications, anti-money laundering, and financing of terrorism procedures and data protection. In addition, staff members are required to be knowledgeable of all the relevant laws and legislation. The strength of the Dominica program is its reliance on the strictest due diligence practices. In fact, we are advised that Dominica has a competitive advantage over other Caribbean countries with similar programs based on the quality of our due diligence processes. We are further advised that even where some countries have lower investments, many applicants have indicated a preference for the Dominica program based on its due diligence. In summary, the staff of the CBIU is responsible for receiving and reviewing all applications of the citizenship. A disclosure form detailing financial information, employment history, and other relevant information with supporting documentation has to be filled out by each applicant and submitted to the unit with payment of due diligence and processing fees. A due diligence investigation and report is carried out on each applicant. This is done by one of the reputable due diligence agencies resident in the United States of America, the United Kingdom, or in Canada. Additional checks are carried out by IMPACTS, that is the CARICOM Implementing Agency for Crime and Security, and friendly governments are asked to run names through their respective databases. Due diligence reports are commissioned exclusively by the unit, and the reports are conveyed directly to the unit by the relevant due diligence agencies. Reports are not provided to, seen by, or discussed with either agents or applicants. Each applicant is assessed on his or her merit, rather than on the country where they were born. Therefore, no nationalities at this time are excluded from applying for, for citizenship under the CBIP in Dominica. However, there is an internal policy to undertake enhanced due diligence and a more in-depth vetting process for individuals strongly associated with countries that may be listed on the country threat index. If a due diligence report is unfavorable, the applicant will be rejected. If it is favorable, then the applicant is evaluated further by the staff of the CBIU. Interviews are not mandatory, but if it is felt that an interview is necessary, then this is arranged. For this purpose, and to ensure that the interviews can be conducted in a timely manner, two committees were appointed to conduct interviews of applicants. The committees carry out the same functions, and one is chaired by the Honorable Attorney General and the other by the Financial Secretary. Each committee includes representatives of the special branch of the police and senior staff of the CBIU. And it is only after an application goes through this process that a recommendation for granting of citizenship is made. At that point, the applicant is asked to pay the investment fee, and on receipt of that fee, a certificate of naturalization is issued. As indicated, the staff are required to undergo training in anti-money laundering and combating or financing of terrorism, and generally, in respect of all AML and CFT, government ensures that all institutions involved in the process are in line with the existing legislation. We must state also that Dominica's AML and CFT legislation is up to date and consistent with the requirements of CFATF and FATF. Further, as a member of the Monetary Council of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, as a means of strengthening AML CFT compliance by the banking sector, the government of Dominica has agreed to transfer the responsibility for AML CFT matters for the commercial banks to the ECCB, who is the regulator of commercial banks. Very soon, the, the legislative changes will be made to facilitate this. The grant of citizenship does not automatically convert to the grant of a passport. After all, it is a citizenship program. 
an applicant who has been granted citizenship has the option of applying for a regular passport. This is a separate, pro separate process. Where applicable, the agent of the applicant facilitates the application process for obtaining a passport for their client. The unit, that is the CBIU, must, within three months of the submission of an application, notify the relevant authorized agent as to whether an application has been approved in principle, denied, or delayed for cause. In addition to the regulations, government may issue guidelines to assist in the administration of the program. For example, specific guidelines for the establishment and operations of an escrow account form part of the agreements signed for the real estate projects approved for financing under the real estate arm of the CBIP. And so the following basic steps constitute the process of applying for citizenship under the Citizenship by Investment Program. The submission of the application, the initial review of the application, the due diligence checks, the examination of the due diligence report, examination of the application by the senior examiners of the Citizenship by Investment Unit, the decision-making process, the payment of the required investment, the issuance of the applicant's naturalization documentation, and where requested, the application and issuance of the applicant's passport. There are a number of documents which must be submitted as part of the application, including but not limited to bank statements, health reports, police record, and any evidence of participation in the military. According to the regulations, citizenship may be denied to any applicant who makes a false statement or omits information requested on any of the forms. Government will also deny citizenship to any applicant who provides information which is false in any material respect on his or her application form, has a criminal record other than in respect to a minor offense, is a subject of a criminal investigation of which he is aware or ought to have been aware, is a potential security risk to Dominica or to any other country, or is, in, is or has been involved in any activity likely to bring disrepute to Dominica. And so the Dominica, government of Dominica has a right to deprive citizens, those granted citizenship under the program, if they are subsequently found to have provided false or incorrect information or concealed any material fact during the application process. By way of statistics, the following information is provided. In 2012, a total of 332 applications were received, 104 were approved, three were declined. 200 and in 2013, 161 applications were received, 184 approved. In 2014, 206 applications received, 189 approved. In 2015, 616 received, 447 approved. In 2016, 1,574 received, 1,542 approved. Of course, you will note some applications received in one year may be processed in the following year based on the time of the receipt of the application. The regulations also make provision for the appointment of agents. In the regulations, authorized agent means a person licensed by the Citizenship by Investment Unit who has paid the required fee. Offer, authorized agents are issued licenses on an annual basis, but government at this time does not regulate the fees charged by agents to the applicants. An ongoing review of the program includes the policy on authorized agents and sub-agents, where a sub-agent may be engaged by an approved agent to undertake work on his behalf and to be his or her representative in the marketplace. I mentioned earlier that the regulations provide for two investment streams. The funds raised under the direct cash option, which is one stream, are used to finance budgetary items such as projects included in the public sector investment program, the administrative costs such as marketing and due diligence fees paid to the firms undertaking these activities on behalf of government, and any special facilities such as the loan facilities placed at the aid bank. These accounts are managed at the technical level 
with the signatories being the financial secretary, the budget controller, the accountant general, the senior examiner, and the corporate service officer at the Citizenship by Investment Unit. Under the second investment stream, an escrow account is established for the development projects being undertaken by the private sector. These include the hotel projects for which agreements have been signed. Payments from the escrow account are made on joint signatures from the government representative, i.e. the financial secretary or the budget controller, and a signatory of the developer. Such disbursements from the escrow account are made on the basis of validation of claims verified by an independent assessor appointed for each project. Post-Tropical Storm America, resources raised from the CBI have been used to, to finance the rehabilitation work. Of course, government received funds from friendly governments and institutions, and these funds were utilized immediately after the storm for the immediate cleanup and for other short-term works. Since then, government has relied on the resources from the CBI to finance the recovery. Of note are the airport rehabilitation, replacement of culverts, road rehabilitation throughout the country. <coughs> Of course, this is not an exhaustive list, and on a daily basis, a number of projects arise coming as a result of the passage of Tropical Storm America. The other options available to government would be to pursue grants, raise taxes, increase borrowing, or at worst, not focus on rehabilitation at all. The substantial sums required for rehabilitation cannot be easily met through taxes. And if all that is needed to be raised through loans, it would mean adding at least another $1.3 billion to do dollars to Dominica's debt, <clears throat> since that $1.3 billion represents the value of the loss post-tropical South America. And given the concept of adopting a Build Back Better approach to the recovery, <clears throat> clearly the amount would far surpass the $1.3 billion. It is also government's policy to keep debt at a sustainable level, with the target being the attainment of a debt to GDP ratio of 60% by 2030. While some of the recovery will have to be financed by contracting new loans, having to finance all of the rehabilitation through loans is clearly unsustainable. It is also true that the modalities through which grant resources were provided in the past have changed. This change is not specific to Dominica, but it is the new trend among developed countries to provide less grant financing to developing countries. It is also well known that many developed and developing countries are experiencing their own economic challenges and as such are not able to offer the level of financial support that they may have done in the past. Of course, beyond rehabilitation, there are still other investments which are desirable and necessary if the goal of sustainable economic growth is to be achieved. There is a need to improve resilience to in the impacts of climate change through, for example, the establishment of a disaster vulnerability fund. There is need to improve, continue to improve your access, the possibility of the construction of an international airport. There is need to broaden the road network to ensure that we're not limited to single lane traffic in any areas. There is need for increased investments in both agriculture and tourism. Both of these sectors must be taken to a level where Dominica gains a greater competitive and or comparative advantage. Hence, the facilities placed at the aid bank to assist in agriculture and in tourism. The manufacturing sector must be re-energized re to make a greater contribution to the economy. And so there are ongoing discussions with that sector. And of course, there is the objective of developing cheaper and cleaner energy, that is, the development of the geothermal program. All of these have been given a boost with investments made from the resources raised under the CBIP. The availability of funds, therefore, makes it possible to move ahead with the various activities which will contribute to the long-term economic growth. Additionally, the government of Dominica is committed to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. The achievement of the SDGs is really a reflection of the pro progress made in reducing poverty 
and ensuring that all citizens attain at least the minimum standard of living. The availability of the CBI resources allows government to undertake the investments that are necessary for the attainment of these goals, whether in housing, in education, or in health. This takes us back to the matter of fiscal sustainability. Government will not achieve its goals for economic and social development if it must only rely on tax revenue, unless it chooses to overtax the population. Neither can it overborrow. A lender agency will make loans available subject to a country's ability to repay. And if that is not sustainable, lenders will not lend. Government must therefore find options. The options are not many. The CBIP is one of the options available and one that the government has pursued. While recognizing that every option has a specific lifespan, government has determined that it should maximize the opportunities that are currently possible because of the availability of the CBIP resources and in so doing, will create new prospects for sustainable development. The benefit from the use of the CBI resources are maximized when the resources are utilized for investment rather than being used for day-to-day -day expenditure or for operations. Whether it is the hotels being constructed or rehabilitated, the manu manufacturing companies that are assisted, the farms that are upgraded, or the roads that are built, the intention is that the investments today will guarantee more economic and more sustained economic activity and more employment in the future. Therefore, government is in full support of the position taken by the multilateral partners and institutions such as the IMF and the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which have recommended that CBI resources should be used largely for the investment and for paying down debt and not for regular day-to-day -day operations or recurrent expenditure. We could consider, for example, the 2016-2017 budget, for which all of government's contribution to the capital budget is funded from the Citizenship by Investment Program. The budgeted amount is $171.1 million. This is equivalent to about 12% of GDP. Without the CBI funds, the capital program would either have to be reworked or reduced. Alternatively, there would have to be additional borrowing, which would have resulted in increased debt, as well as increased debt servicing. Legally, debt servicing must be given priority over all other payments, which means all other recurrent expenditures, goods and services, wages and salaries, and transfers would have to be reduced. In conclusion, the Citizenship by Investment Program provides enormous benefit to Dominica at this time. Government's approach is evident by the cautious approach is evident by the fact that time is taken to continuously review, revise, and streamline the program. And further, every effort is made to ensure that the projects selected are solid and beneficial, as government seeks only high quality, stable, and valuable projects that will have a positive effect on the economy of Dominica and overall the well-being of the citizens. I thank you.